All right, hello, we are live. Today is Sunday, February 12th, 2017. And we have one more wonderful webinar with Brooke Allison. Hey, Brooke. Hi, Max. Hi, everyone. Um, how do people find you? What's your, what, uh, you, do, you do private sessions, right? Yes, I do private channeling and intuitive sessions at Brooke, B-R-O-O-K-A-L-Y-S-S-U-M.com. Or you can find me on Facebook, Brooke Alyssum Underwood. Wonderful. Thank you. Do you want to go channeling right away? Sure. Let's do it. All right. First, I'm going to clear all these conflicting energies that it seems to be in the fields today and in the larger cosmos. We just went through a massive shift of consciousness and ascension with the lunar eclipse, Leo full moon, and there are things reconfigurating and intentions are becoming awakened and renewed and almost there's a sort of death and rebirth that happened the past few days. So I'm just recognizing this shamanic time in the self and the self with the others. And I'm imagining crystal golden light coming down from the great central sun, blessing our co-creative beingness, going down our top crown, chakras into our bodies, into our throats, our hearts, our stomach, our legs, our feet, out through the tips of our hands, imagining this crystal golden light from the sun, blessing, replenishing, nourishing, and upgrading this is a technique to ground in the presence with each other and to ground in the presence of the heart with one another. I'm seeing a great oak tree in the center of our circle, wisdom of the ages, wisdom of the fae and the fairy realms here on Cosmic Mother Earth. And I'm seeing this oak as an energetic stabilizer for all of us. And more. The roots of this oak is going deep, deep, deep into the crystalline core of Mother Earth descending miles and miles down below for many layers of rock. The roots are wrapping around this crystalline core of Mother Earth and bringing up Earth energy to meet golden liquid cosmic sun energy. alchemizing the way <coughs> for this transmission and this community seeing together. Calling in all our highest level, level guides, benevolent beings, Any malevolent beings may leave. May the highest good prevail now and forever. Namaste. Namaste. Uh, what would be the topic of today's webinar?
how tools uh, can we use to um, with trees and nature to open portals and to uh, bring uh, love and joy to our neighborhood, human uh, uh, sisters and uh, brothers, uh, how techniques we can uh, use. Mm, wonderful, thank you. My topic would be about the emotions. Um, I'm starting to work with them and there is very little understood about them. And Brooke, um, you're welcome to direct anywhere you like. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. And please let me know if it's ever difficult to hear me and I'll speak up. You're good. Okay. We'll start with the trees. These wisdom keepers of the ages. The most predominant, long withstanding structures as they have both ascended and descended through hundreds and thousands, millions of years here on planet Earth. They seek our acknowledgement. They seek our attention. They ask for our peace. but they also welcome any conflict or misalignment, confusion or strife. They welcome everything, but they symbolize eternal peace and presence and connection to the fairy and nature realms and as communicators with the cosmic realms. Their antennae, acupuncture points on the earth. When we start to listen to them, they will tell us their stories they will tell us their wisdom. They will also tell us some jokes if we are so open to this. There are certain ley lines on the earth that are because of these grand masters. They ask that we recognize them as masters because that is what they are. They are the grandfathers and the grandmothers of the earth. Ways in which you can communicate with the trees are by placing your hands around their trunk Asking permission, first of all, to do so. And if you receive a yes, you may work with them and communicate with them. There are some trees that will give you a no if you ask to work with them. You must respect that no. If there is a tree with a predominant yes or an affirmative yes, you can connect with its higher tree self. Ask it simple questions. How long have you been here on earth? Where is your family? How long will you continue to guard us? 
And if you aren't a tree guardian, what else are you? There's magic hidden in trees. There are spirits in the trees. Often we can see holes and knobs, crevices, indents that look like the human body. Trees are an original symbol of the erotic nature of Mother Earth. Look for representations of humanness. Perhaps a large nose. Perhaps an opening, a womb, or something that looks like a vulva. or a lingam, penis, it is all nature. And the trees show us this metaphysical reality as they embody human characteristics in human personified ailments, both of the physical human body in both of the spiritual human body. Yes, there are sick trees. Yes, there are mean trees. Yes, there are trees that sing loudly and joyously connect with the dragons the fae. The trees are unique. It may help to start studying the different kinds of trees in your neighborhood, first and foremost. The trees outside of your window, if there are any. The trees in your local park trees that you may read about in books or watch in a video or film. Start noticing, observing their spirit. This is a way of yin, of a more feminine approach to spirituality. All we have to do is listen. And if it's difficult to receive information, ask for assistance. And also imagine. Imagine what the tree would be speaking to you. Imagine what kind of multidimensional realm they live in. Imagination is your key to communication with the nature and fairy realms. Trees are no different in this way. You'll soon learn your different toolkit Perhaps your inner vision. Perhaps you actually see spirits from taking photographs of the trees. Trust your intuition if you are to take a photograph, even if you do not see something at first. Trees are here to observe and also to reflect. Are there any more questions on trees? 
Yes, sometimes I send uh, a quiet fire on the trees for the tree to broadcast, but I didn't know if I, I was intrusive. Did you answer me? You sent Aquarian fire? Yes. The trees were like humans to be gentle with them, to honor them, to respect them, and to always ask permission. Even if it's a well-known tree in the community or a tree that you're familiar with, you must establish an open rapport by means of asking permission. I'm sensing that an apology is needed for this tree. Thank you. I will do it. Blessed be. Hi. Hello. I have a tree that is near my home. It's actually in my yard. I connect to it on certain occasions. And in return, as I went outside, I saw a crease of a triangular formation. And above it, there was this figure of the Chukwu Ray symbol. What does that signify, or what does that represent to me over time? What was the symbol that you saw above? I'm not sure if I'm familiar with that. It's a Reiki healing symbol. It's oh. the first symbol. Mm. Yes, for you, my dear, it feels as if this is a signature a signature tree for you and that this is a form of their direct communication with your communication system. Only you would be able to identify that. And so that opens up more of your chakras, more of your energy body to receive information from this particular tree. It's a bit of a metaphysical blessing, particularly attuned to your energy. So this is a sacred gift for you. And the thing is, is that because of that, I would feel depressed or sad of me leaving or leaving away from the tree that I always connect to metaphysically and I always use it for means of various communications and what should I do or should I say goodbye to the tree that has served, served me? Hmm. What I'm receiving is that we don't ever say goodbye to those that we love. And it goes for the same of the nature, spirits, and the Davic, fey realm, and the elementals and the trees. There's always energy and spirit that you can tap into. It is similar to if you had a beloved grandmother transition, you can still communicate with her through love and through the heart portal. It's not an intellect, intellectual experience. It's something that is deeply felt within the heart and the feelings are gold. Even if you're feeling grief or sadness that the tree is no longer with you. You are allowed to experience all the spectrum of emotions, 
in your relationship with this beloved tree. But know that its spirit is always with you, as this is a key to multidimensional reality. Nothing ever leaves us unless we want it to, because we have choice and free will. But of course, if something that the tree communicates with you, that asks that you release this contract, listen to the tree. Because it's human and tree co-communication. <clears throat> so know that the trees have feelings too. So check in with the tree as well. And you'll know some clearer ideas. But trees are slow too. You might not have a direct answer. It might be months or years that you know exactly the type of presence this tree has in your life. You may awaken one morning and say, ah, the tree is a guide in my dreams. Or ah, the tree is a portal to my sacred memory if I choose to look in the past for love. Open, open, open the channels and you'll soon understand this tree's certain kind of love that it has for humanity and for you, beloved. Does my tree have a name? And seeing Jacob, Can uh, my um, fairy's friend uh, help me to to do my uh, forgiveness to the trees one day? Mm. They would love to help. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions on tree spirits or fairies or nature? No. Yes, it is needed to open portals to to uh, help with uh, energy flux. If I understand your question correctly, yes, it's very beneficial to work with the Fae and the Davic to open spirits because they are the original guardians of this earth. They are ancient, ancient wisdom, earth magic, if you will. Okay, thank you. How, how do I, how do I meditate or is there a meditation technique in order to synchronize and co-create and connect to the trees? Mm. I'm seeing that if this is truly an intention that you want to open, a sacred relationship with the tree spirits or Jacob here, that it is beneficial to work wherever 
you normally meditate and invite a tree meditation. Invite them to come in as you invite your highest level guides, any ascended masters, ancestors, cosmic allies. Invite the tree spirits. And in this, in similar fashion to how I guided a great oak tree to ground us into the crystalline core of Mother Earth before we started this channeling. You can imagine this tree in the room that you're meditating in. There's a tree in the middle of my room right behind me that's grounding these energies. You can also imagine how you're sitting in meditation, that you are inside of a tree trunk and that you're being grounded in the heavens and the earthly realms. I see also pictures of trees on either your altar or wall where you sit at your desk. The more that you train your subconscious mind to invite the trees into your life, the easier it will be to communicate with them because you have retrained your mind. And that is key to connecting in different spiritual allies in different spiritual energies. May it be archetypes, gods or goddesses. The trees are no different. But yes, it does take effort and intention around it. So get clear on your level of intention of how you are to communicate with the trees. Did you finish, Pete? Yes. Yes, uh, I am a gardener. As a gardener, I have to abuse and cut trees. And uh, how to deal with that? Mm. I would first breathe. Breathe with the trees. Take in oxygen with them and release CO2. Noticing that trees represent the lungs. Connect them with your body so it's an embodiment feeling. It'll act as a sort of prayer a recognition first and secondly gratitude gratitude for them being keepers of the land and gratitude for the sort of physical spirit they are. They ask simply for gratitude. And of course, for intention, if you're cutting down a tree, they want to make sure that it's intentional and for the highest good of all. Thank you. What is the name of the natural goddess? There are quite a few names of nature goddesses. Perhaps the simplest is Gaia, G-A-I-A, -A, as she invokes all of Mother Earth.
Thank you. Someone, uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Max, sorry. Another question? No? Someone said uh, to me, I am uh, dear to Gaia. Uh, can you explain in two words more about, about that? You have an affection for dirt. You have an affection for soil. And that is what they mean. Thank you so much. I have finished. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, Max. Hey. Um, regarding the portals, um, I was told there is a portal on the ocean. I went there and meditated, and then I discovered there is several more portals on the beach and in the ocean. When I kayak, I see them. And I started, um, I planned two weeks from now on Sunday. No, it was Saturday. On Saturday, a portal upgrade meditation uh, with people. So I will do a fire and a circle and uh, drumming and... Um, I'll talk about that, but I have no theories. I just kind of have intuitive hinges what to do. So I invite any guidance what actually to be done there. I'm seeing the connection of sort of great etheric crystal diamond pull that you, Max, will embody as a facilitator of this circle of these portal openings. I'm seeing also wings coming out from behind you, acting as an invitation for others to come inside of your wings and inside of the energy. It's sort of a circle protection. I'm seeing that to be important. to upgrade your protection skills and to tune in if there's any energies you feel within the group or even on the land because the land might not want you there. You have to listen after you ask for permission and be totally okay with that. Be non-attached to what the land has to say to you. But this is a way of sort of acting like a human pendulum. Acting as a rod with your wings. Asking permission to do this energetic work. If there is a no, alter your frequency in your location, just slightly, either one or both, either alter your frequency and ask again, or move locations and that movement will alter your frequency. Mm -hmm. But just keep asking, keep asking and feel into your body. Feel, feel, feel. And if you feel like <laughs> there is any kind of blank, you're not receiving information, mm -hmm. I'm seeing that it's helpful to use sound. So if you have a drum or if someone else has a drum, 
This will encourage the spirits to help you and to come in. And for you yeah. to get into your feeling body more to access mm -hmm. those emotions. Mm -hmm. have yeah, I th go ahead. Just any more questions about this for you, please? I just realized um, it should be basically a celebration and a performance for the spirits. Mm. It's a given. It's a process of giving, not guiding. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we basically come there and make sort of donation of music. They would love that, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any more questions? You can go into your question of emotions, Max. Yeah, 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 emotions, yeah. I um, have very little theory about emotions. For me, they were so far tools. I use them as tools for analytical thinking. Because analytical thinking is very limited, so I plug in emotions as a way to think better. And apparently there is more to that. It's uh, the emotions are not only tool for thinking, they are a tool for manifestation and they are a big part of the design of the human. Yes. And the question is, what do you know about emotions? I have very little theory. Emotions are everything. They maintain our homeostasis more than anything else in our bodies. It is true that thoughts create our reality, but what's behind thoughts is this rainbow spectrum of emotions that influence our thoughts constantly. Every thought has almost roots of emotions. Perhaps, Max, when you're researching, your emotion is to discover, your emotion is curiosity, where your emotion is kind of this relentless search. These are philosophies, but there are also emotions and they're very, very highly tied in of how your philosophy of life and your emotions of life have to do with each other. Your philosophies create your reality. And when we have begun to understand a new philosophy in our lives, perhaps shift into a new way of thinking or perspective, we shift because there was an emotional reaction. There was something that went simply aha or ah. Emotions and feelings are really similar. They play with each other. They sort of tumble around the spiritual realms. And there's always something to explore. It is predominantly in the mind. As much as it is in the heart, we talk about heart-based ascension of unconditional love. But first we must think that in our thinking mind to feel it deeply. The brain and the heart are such beautiful communicators in this way. There are points if you get into a meditative, deeply relaxed state 
you can get into openness of just feeling directly into the heart and the heart feeling out. But for the sake of practical reality, mindfulness based living is to be mindful of what the emotional worlds are in order to be in alignment with the other worlds like you say the analytical the intellectual the creative worlds exploring these emotions and also putting names to them if you're just beginning to explore will be very helpful and of course studying the chakra systems i will for instance some say is a solar plexus i think more of the head crown chakra i speak the throat whatever is your own system of study that will help you understand emotions this is what alchemy is truly is understanding the emotional human body the personal human experience in play in relationship with other emotional human experiences it's the power of empathy that if we really understand our own emotions and shift them accordingly to what is in the greatest alignment of your perspective and your understanding of self and the world at that time, we will develop this empathy that is long withstanding, that is something that a lens in which you see the world is through empathy and that will turn into compassionate action it will turn into compassionate self-love perhaps even self-forgiveness for some on this call <laughs> I um, when I reflect on my emotions, I want to cry, and I want to cry. I usually don't, and basically there is a conflict within me. One is desiring to process the emotion, more like you know, just you know, people say you should process them, but and another one is desire to be happy and stay on the positive, and this kind of conflict, I. On one, on one end, I want to go and uh, dive into negative feelings and drama. And on the other hand, I want to stay and create a positive reality, stay in the positive and create a positive reality. And I don't know how to resolve it, but basically my positive side wins and the negative side remains unresolved. What I'm sensing is that this is an example of duality in human reality and experience is a sort of if i feel this emotion then xyz if i repress this feeling of emotion then xyz so first i'm guiding i'm getting the guidance that we must acknowledge this duality of emotions of that whatever we may perceive one emotion to be we may try to differentiate that from another emotion in the moment. In the moment, we must experience presence with all that arises. We must let the dams break if there are tears needing to be flood, or we must let the balloons lift if there is joy happening in the body, even if it's in what may some think as an 
inappropriate situation. I personally have felt joy at funerals. And I've allowed myself to feel joy when others were grieving. Of course, I wasn't saying to whomever beside me, why aren't you experiencing joy? That's not part of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is navigating your own emotions, honoring them, whatever they are, and picking up intuitively or feeling from the heart what others are feeling and honoring them at their states. Honoring children who are screaming and crying nonstop. They're at a state of whatever that state may be, neediness or worry or anxiety or simply just crying. We don't know. But we honor them. And by doing that, we honor our own emotions that may look societally inappropriate. When we see someone crying in public, when we see someone grieving in public, it brings us all back into our bodies, into our hearts, opening up the emotions will only open up further ascension. Imagine that everywhere you went, there was at least two or three people who were having a predominant emotional experience that was visible, that it wasn't more internally emotional, which is true, how a lot of humans and a lot of Westerners experience emotions is very internally and repressed. That was a program that we are shifting right now is that emotions are not worthy. Our emotions are only things to be repressed and not shown with other people. Perhaps the program of others won't love me if I share with them this certain emotion that my Thinking mind may think is complicated or inappropriate. I encourage us all to share first with our own experience, being with our emotions first and foremost, experiencing that in our body first. And soon we'll be able to share that with others and it won't feel so abnormal. It is normal for us to be able to cry at any time or to be able to feel happiness or just simple peace. It is normal and I'm just here to remind us all of that and that the ascension process is hugely to do with how we can configure our emotional bodies in every moment in how we can dance with others in their emotional bodies. It's emotional intelligence that will open the veils of truth because, because truth is love. And for humans to get to that love, it is not through our mind. It is truly through our heart and through our feeling capacities. It is beyond thinking. And of course, I encourage you to use your mind to get you to feelings. There are some helpful things for us to shift our perspective in our mind in order to get into our body. I encourage that, of course. But emotional intelligence is opening all the chakras of energy that have the emotions running through them underneath. We have a, 
In our family, we have tons of emotional challenges. Like kids make you really upset, you know, especially one of them is um, professional kind of a talent on making you upset. He is like younger than teenager, but, um, you know, he has a teenager's trait, find a soft spot, touch a spot on you and um, bring you to madness and um, get you out of your comfort zone. So we constantly repress the anger. And um, there is tons of it accumulated in us, making us like uh, a complete cripples emotionally. Like to get out of this spiral, it takes quite a lot of work to just unwind, I guess. First you accumulate it, accumulate it, you hide it, you hide it, you hide it. And then uh, unwinding is sort of tough. I, I found the easiest is just to smoke nicotine. Nicotine kind of drains it, you become normal again. You kind of become normal. I don't know what happens, but what is the physical nature of that clearing? But nicotine allows you just to clear up all that anger. And uh, I'm doing a lot of chanting. So chanting is my way right now. And I'm looking at dancing. And you're very good in doing that, emotional dancing, kind of improvisational emotional dancing. Uh, can you share some uh, patterns, how you would ap approach that? With using dance as intentional way, expression to move emotions, it starts in the heart. It starts with questioning, what is it that I want to transform? What is it that I want to release? What is it that is no longer serving this present moment? Relax deeply into the body and then move with that emotion. It's sort of like moving with the spirit each emotion is a different spirit. And so asking to just move with spirit, we ask to, it's like a um, two hitter question. We move with emotions as well. But yes, intentional movement of emotions, of noticing perhaps that there's anger in the emotional body. There are different ways for us to use that energy and to transformative knowledge. Sometimes that means doing something that breaks a sweat such as jumping jacks or running at the beach a few times a week. Sometimes that means strenuous, a little slightly more strenuous activity to get things going. If you're feeling really blocked or really like things are bubbling up, it is very healthy to move those emotions through the body in fact, it is one of the ways that we get back to spirit. Is once we move and engage with spirit, with our emotions in our body, then we align back into presence. And with that, the intention of peace. What is physical nature of emotions? Um, how do they feel, how do they fit into the uh, ideas of energy bodies? You said an emotion is a spirit, so do they have their own free will and things like that? What, what is an emotion? Hmm, that's a beautiful question. Let me look. We 
because we are humans on earth here, we do have free will. And so we have choice of our perception of emotions. So I'm seeing that the guidance here is to sit with an emotion, for instance, if it's angst or anxiety. Ask yourself if it has free will or if you have choice in that moment. Often on paths of spirituality, we want to process that emotion to our higher self so we can process discernment on the value of this emotion. Observing the emotion and then having a discernment of what to do with it next. Sometimes it's okay to choose a yin approach to emotions versus a yang. For instance, if you just want to sit with angst in a meditation or in qigong or some sort of energy, gentle movement, that's fine. Other ways, if you want to go into exploration of where this angst is coming from, perhaps you want to speak with a loved one about your angst. Perhaps you want to see a counselor of some sort. That's more of the yang approach, I'd say. But I'm sensing it's a question of where you are with your relationship to emotions, not necessarily what they mean in the physical body, because it's different for every person. It really is different. Yeah, I, I, I sense there is lots of different kinds of emotional types in terms of their physical nature, but I imagine them as vortexes of energy, and uh, most of them living in the heart, like it's a heart. Each, each chakra has an energetic body, which kind of is defined but but it's by its um, main frequency and the heart chakra has its own f energetic body which i think is the main emotional body so that's why you kind of go into the heart vibration to relate to the emotions but also i think there is a lot of emotion sitting in the mind so so i have any person in the mind is associated with a certain emotional pattern Every subject, every object, every concept is emotionally charged, and uh, there is tons of that in the mind. So it's kind of, I guess, in an overlap between all energetic bodies could be related as emotions. So, so there is much more complexity there. Yes, absolutely. It's a science in its own in its own way. Emotions I met. I met recently my um, my emotional self. It was in a session with um, some sort of analytical therapists of spiritual nature, where she guided me to find the reasons for my sicknesses and uh, kind of personalize them. So that was I was channeling my own emotional self, and uh, she was sort of in, into the tragedy, but also she was very wise, empathic, and um, intuitive. So it's my intuitive self and emotional self is about the same thing. Yes. Comment anywhere about this. Yes. Um, emotional and intuitive self is, is very similar. It's highly similar. In fact, the greatest way that you can develop your clairvoyance or your intuition is to first for lack of a better word, work on your emotions and work on how you're reacting to your emotions. Asking yourself if we can be non-reactive to emotions first. And if we can't, then we just, we observe. 
observation and the goal of being, of practicing non-reaction to emotions is a spiritual teaching in all lineages. And it's one that gets us back into our intuition so we can make discerning choices in the present moment, wherever we may be, in a family dynamic, out at the grocery store, perhaps driving on the freeway, we have a choice if we want to react to the outside world's emotions, always. And because of that, that affects our intuition. So the way that we choose to engage with our emotions affects how we engage with our intuitive faculties. And it's the mastery of emotions that brings us into deeper mastery of intuition and mastery of connection. This is something that the great yogis have taught. This is something that most Buddhas know. Yeshua knew this too. Egyptian, Atlanteans, Lemurians knew about this emotional alchemy and that if we truly understood our emotions and loved them unconditionally as well, then that would bring us into greater states of awareness of self and others, and with that direct guidance to come through and freedom, honestly. I have a question. But it is uh, empathy the first step for telepathy. It is, yes. Um, the question comes up very often. Basically, once in a while, we get overwhelmed with sadness. And when we analyze it, we realize it comes from outside. It's something unrelated directly to our life, personal life. It's something which you just pick up from uh, the global community. So you weren't there, but the global community kind of knocks on your door, emotional door, and you feel empathic tragedy or sadness or um, anger or other discord or just discord it's just a mess sometimes it's simply a mess so closing yourself up is uh, closing up yourself is sort of what we do and it kind of blocks a lot of things what would be the answer what would be the art of kind of staying open but not picking up on what you don't want to pick up excellent question i'm seeing a few things first is establishing boundaries with your higher self of what type of information you allow yourself to receive and how you receive this information for instance, many are affected by the Facebook feed. They're affected by other people's emotional realities and they're affected by news realities, whatever that may be. But we have choice into whether or not we want that to latch on to us or if we want it to simply dissolve some of us may simply need to be offline more because we cannot handle it in our emotional configuration. Some of us can be online the same amount. Perhaps we have to hide certain feeds in our Facebook or hide certain, hide or block, I mean, information, or that we choose to disengage with certain experiences of information because their emotional um, value or the emotional frequency is too much to handle and that's simply okay. Many of us feel recharged going back to communicating with the trees and the nature realms. There's so much positive 
charge coming through the nature realms and connecting with Mother Earth that is beyond anything we could do in society than to actually put our feet on the earth or in water even if it's difficult for you to be with earth water taking showers or baths intentionally and using that to cleanse and clear any psychic imprints or emotional imprints from things that are not your own so discerning what your boundaries are with you and the world it's you and interpersonal relationships, it's you in your creative projects, it's you in your work, it's you in how you have a conversation with your neighbor. It's an art in observing what feels good, what feels peaceful will help you discern that. The other thing is having a good filtration system because of this. Having high intentions to only filtrate the highest good for you in your meditations. Filtrating only things that will support you in love and light, that will support you in grace and ease. And everything else may filtrate out because it is not yours to experience. We honor them as others' experiences and perhaps the frequency in the world, their experiences. But we ask our sovereignty, our freedom, our self-sustained light to take presence and to take center stage, if you will. Our sovereignty is our birthright and our sovereignty from all emotions outside of our own energy bodies. That is a way for us to maintain energetic hygiene is truly what you speak of. Energetic hygiene is emotional hygiene and spiritual hygiene as well. Thank you. You mentioned Facebook and it is, um, yeah, it was becoming biggest part of my life recently. I organized a lot of local events and Facebook is a great tool for that. So I don't even read read the, how do you call it, the wall or whatever, the, the, the feed. I don't read the feed, but uh, just because you organize things, people start connecting to you. And um, that can take full day and uh, you get plugged in and sucked through the main, many different desires. Even if you filter out things, it's... Uh, it's uh, a new way of giving and taking. Yes. I, I get a lot of a lot from there. It's uh, positive feedback, neg negative feedback, getting things done. So it's not it's it's really useful. But I just turn it off one once in a while. I, I have to turn it off once in a while, and um, it's something very new to me. I, I I used to do it like ten years ago. It was a, another blogging system called Live Journal, but now it's kind of becoming a, again a big part of my life. Mm. I would invite any more insights if you have. Immediately, I see discipline here. Mm -hmm. Having discipline of the time in which you engage with Facebook, such as once a day or twice a day and for X amount of time. How you engage with Facebook, either it's on your smartphone or only on your computer. Perhaps you don't have the Facebook app on your phone. Simply adjusting how you communicate with technology. And this goes not just Facebook, it goes with Gmail. It goes with all kinds of chat, all kinds of newsletters you receive, marketing you receive. Because they are wonderful ways for us to tap into consciousness and to commune with others. It is a gift, truly, but there also is a healthy boundary needing to be established for each one of us. And that healthy boundary may be us having discipline around it. It may be really being clear with our intention that I cannot check my email for the first hour of the day, or that perhaps I only check my email between 
noon and 3 p.m., same as Facebook. Playing with your schedule and playing with how you engage with technology will be our greatest asset because it's only going to get more infiltrated in the psychic realms. We're only, we're just going to a place where technology will soon take over. And we recognize that as seers and we understand that as part of the ascension that we have technology here too, helping us along the way. But we have choice always in how plugged in we want to be or how plugged out we want to be. I encourage us to connect with the earth more than we connect with technology even if that means in our mind's eye that we're connecting with earth and spiritual energy as we're engaging, communicating on our computers. There needs to be a clear intention for each individual around that and discipline is needed. Yay. I, yeah, that's very, very right to the point. I go to meditate outside, walk on the trail in the nature, and then I realize I have to go on Facebook on my phone and uh, coordinate our meetings with friends in the nature. So, so I get plugged in, in, in even there. And, you know, it's always a question, would the spirits approve if I just for 10 minutes press buttons on my uh, Facebook and connect to that energy? And... Uh, you know, sometimes I decide one way, somewhat, sometimes I decide another way, sometimes I just don't take a smartphone with me. I'm seeing to ask your higher self first, Max, and ask, I'm seeing, be more consistent in that. For instance, if you leave your smartphone at home or in the car, try that out for a week. If you have a consistent schedule of walking in the park, try that out for a week and then see how it feels. And try it out a week if you're walking and meditating in nature and then have five to 10 minutes on your phone. See how that differentiates your reality later on. See if there's less anxiety, see if there's less um, mental energy being, uh, given away because a lot of this is about how much we give our energy away to outside sources and how much that drains our emotional body that we cannot even see our emotions because they're so drained and outside our own higher self and our own embodied self so just noticing where those energies go why they go there and how we can prevent them from going there because a lot of this is conscious preventative care, just like how we would approach the body holistically and in medicine. It's preventative care, something that is very classical and Taoist and ancient Eastern traditions is preventative medicine. And right now we're changing, we're shifting consciousness in healthcare to be more preventative more on the grassroots, more in individuals, seeking out natural solutions, natural paths, herbal medicine, shifting into diets that are more incongruent to heal ailments. That's preventative care. So, and what I recommend is preventative care in how you engage with media. So we don't spiral out after the end of a week and we just feel so fried or that we just feel out of body because a lot of the times when we're engaging with technology, we're going out of body. And that's when different addictive entities can, can come in and can confuse our own energy systems. So we want to be very mindful of that. Have you finished? Yes, thank you. Max? Kina, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I was told uh, that uh, we 
are constructed by uh, layers of emotions. And I would like to know when we dissolve um, emotions and uh, energies, uh, does it let a hole or it is replaced uh, automatically with a new energy? When we dissolve energies that are not serving us in the higher good, it is replaced with the exalted form of that energy. And usually that exalted form is harmony. Harmonious, homeostasis, peacefulness, and awareness. We can imagine the emotions being replaced by light, being replaced by golden orbs of love, or just golden orbs white orbs purple orbs it just depends we can use our visualization of what that may be some it may be sacred geometry is replacing their emotions but use a visualization of what that may replace is what i'm seeing And uh, there is a number of, uh, of uh, layers or, or, or we can uh, accumulate uh, illimited la layers of uh, emotions. I'm seeing that there's different teachings around this. There are infinite numbers of layers, but for you, there's eight. And uh, each uh, layer, it's a mix of uh, all uh, kinds of emotions? Yes, emotions that are of the self, the emotions that are the self in relation to others, to the world, to culture, to ancestors, to spirit realms. Yes. Okay. Uh, so each uh, person have a, a variable number of uh, layers. It is variable. Yes, it is. And it just depends on what is in the highest alignment of your perception of emotions. So for me, I see an infinite number of layers because that is how I perceive my healing is that it's infinite. Others may have a more structured seven chakra system or three chakra system, or what I channeled for you, my dear, there seems to be eight energies, layers for you. So that is, that is the wisdom I have there. Thank you so much. Let's now speak about um, repressed erotic emotions that I guess is so frequent for us in, the, in any society and especially in modern society. There is, a, it happens like all the time, right? There is erotic desire and repression of erotic desire and proper behavior and um, you I always balance it, right? You always balance in that. But sometimes it's just uh, overwhelming the balancing of that. Can you comment on uh, how to take it? Mm. Mm. allowing ourselves to feel erotic desires first and foremost because there's nothing shameful there's nothing wrong there's nothing bad about this so releasing that program infinitely releasing what the church may have told us about that, what teachings and traditional religion, some may even say patriarchal or just simply dominating religion, releasing that program consistently The nature of erotic desire is in such 
dance with the nature of Mother Earth. How we see a flower bloom. How we see bees pollinate them. That is very erotic in nature. Looking at stories of how erotic becomes interchangeable with the word innocence. Erotic is innocence. If we observe things from a lens of that innocence, then we can observe our own reactions to repress sexual emotions as innocence, as simple childlike innocence of curiosity, of desire, of what the body is telling us through our heart or through our genitalia or through our sexual chakras, our lower root chakras, perhaps even our mind. First and foremost, observe the innocence in that. Secondly, start to cultivate mindful practices around sexual energy. There are lots of systems of healing chi, sexual chi, either through meditation or through practices of movement. But it's something that asks us, like emotions, to get back into our body and to get back into the higher truth of our body. Not what we were taught, not that we were learned, not what other family members have projected onto us, not what society tells us what is right or wrong, going back into the simplicity of the body and the innocence of the body. Then we will know our own true erotic selves. But again, similar to knowing the truth of our authenticity, we can only know that truth if we know what is our authentic sexual self and our authentic sexual nature as well. Um, can you speak about the value of abstaining from sex? Celibacy has been a spiritual tool for eons. It has been a practice of wisdom in human experience. It is something that allows us time or timelessness, you never know, and space to explore our own selves and to know intrinsically that an individual human can be solely dependent on our own sexual energy without outside needs or outside desires. Celibacy is a practice of contentment. It is a practice of training the mind to feel in the heart and to channel energy that brings life force and chi. We can simply arouse ourself by practice of meditation and relaxation and tools of meditation. There really is 
no need for outside engagements of sex. However, I do encourage oxytocin to be moved. So touch if you were to go on the path of celibacy in forms of hugs or massages or receiving Reiki or holding hands. These are things that many cultures do naturally. Men holding hands, holding each other, embracing each other with hugs and affection. This is all normal. And it's part of the oxytocin release that is necessary for us to remain connected to others and to connect it to higher spirit. But celibacy is a spiritual practice and it has a lots and lots of gifts of it. But there are ways in how we can practice celibacy but still be modern in our needs. Because if we are going to celibacy only to further repress our emotions or repress our sexuality, that will harm us. So we intentionally use celibacy so we can understand our own sexual, sensual nature and how we can feel deeply ourself first bliss is in the body first mm, let me share so yeah breaking the repressions of the society i went through that when i was long time ago i was like in my teenagers in Soviet Union, sex was very prohibited. So it was kind of a taboo. At least you don't speak about it, it was very hidden, right? So breaking away from that was, was a big part of my teenager ages and maybe 20, 20s, right? And then I discovered that you use sex for things which you are supposed to do yourself, like uh, the sex, you use sex to get your mother, the motherly energy, the spiritual support instead of actually, instead of meditating, you use sex, right? And it's kind of gets misused and it stays on the way of your spiritual growth. I guess it's a later realization. Much, much later. You just, instead of growing spiritually, you you become dependent on whoever whoever provides you that spiritual support. Instead of connecting to God, you connect to whoever can make you happier right and now i discovered just by i guess by chance maybe but i was working on some manifestation thing and it didn't it didn't happen didn't happen didn't happen until i just by coincidence i was abstaining from sex for longer time than usual much longer time than usual it just happened it was like coincidence of several factors I, and then I guess the charge of some energy was accumulated sufficient so I can I can manifest something which was hard to manifest before. So these are two two different things. Like I guess both no, it's two examples of the idea that abstinence is can be used for practical reasons. I guess that's that's what I wanted to comment. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a method of manifestation because just reflecting on what you said, said Max, um, we sort of move our creative energy into that realm of sex with another human. In that movement of creative energy, if it's not for if you're not clear on what that's for, 
then it can just be a waste of energy, just like what we talked about of technology. For instance, having sex with technology, we can even bridge these two topics. Is that we're sort of, for lack of a better word, prostituting our energy into technology, and that is distracting us from our sovereign spiritual manifestation capabilities. And that goes the same with if we're using sex, sex as a distraction, or if we're using sex as indulgence and not purposefully high alchemy, spiritual, intentional facilitation of love that is not just between two people, but love that transcends and love that is connected to a higher spirit that brings deep healing. There's not an intention <clears throat> for healing around sexual relations, then often it does not serve. Often it brings us back into ego. It brings us back into desire mind. It brings us back into lust. It brings us back to things that are distractions from holiness of the body and knowing that the body is whole in and of itself. And it's a difficult balance for many of us. We're all still learning these spiritual tools of how to engage with our sex energy with one another. And everyone is slightly different, yes, of course. But I think we can agree on that creativity is healing. And where we want our creativity to be channeled into healing, into manifestation, into divine nourishment is perhaps a question here. When you talk about creativity, what is the definition of uh, this creativity? It's uh, for uh, all the aspects in life? Mm. Creativity is our reality. It is what was birthed out of nothingness that created this whole reality. It is birth and it is rebirthing. Okay, thank you. I have heard uh, when we uh, misuse uh, sex, we destroy some uh, liquids in uh, our glands, uh, cerebral, cerebral gland, glands. It is true? What organs? Cere uh, brain uh, glands. Oh, cerebral organs. Mm. It feels that we harm them feels like we don't destroy them, but it feels that, yes, our brain becomes a reptilian brain. It does not become an enlightened, mindful brain that is tapped into the dimensional realms. The reptilian brain just wants it. It wants, you know, something to meet its craving in the moment. It's almost a slightly addictive quality to it. But if we identify that as being the human condition, that we are naturally, usually, codependent on something outside of ourself, we're mindful of that. We can bring that codependence into healthy interdependence. But first and foremost, true sovereignty some may say it as true self-dependence of our own internal love and our own internal flame. That is everything. That is emotions, that is sex, that energy, that is spiritual energy, all of that. Thank you. It feels like Max, that we may be finished for today. How are you feeling? Uh, I have a few more questions. 
Do you mind going another 15 minutes? We can do 15 more minutes, yes. Sure. Um, so one thing I wanted to comment was that um, the opposite is true as well, that, you know, extreme abstinence harms the everything in the same, in, in similar way as extreme in, indulgence in sex. Especially in the Western world, you can see tons of people who are, whose uh, energies are collapsed because they, they haven't been touched. Yes. Not even sex, they haven't been touched by humans. They kind of are so much by themselves and scared and uh, repressed the the whole some some energy fields are completely collapsed in them so you, you see um how do you say emotionally and energetically um what's this word disabled disabled people yes um my last question was or series of questions connecting emotions uh erotics erotic component of life and ascension. So emotions and ascension and uh, erotics and ascension. How do they play around? Mm, beautiful question. We can experience the erotic in every moment if we choose to do so. Because nature is inherently erotic, our interaction, which is simply being here on earth, is erotic. Our senses are the key to experiencing the erotic. Our smell, taste, our deep appreciation is erotic. When we appreciate our bodies, when we appreciate our sun above, getting into a level of gratitude, deep appreciation, is a sort of turn on for the human senses and for eroticism to be present in all things. We must be grateful for being here on earth at all times in order to access the multitudes of pleasure. That is pleasure of being in the body, pleasure of the heart, pleasure of the mind. We can have an erotic experience reading poetry or engaging with something such as gardening or painting or simply eating a really wonderfully loved, blessed meal, food as erotic. We can simply engage too in something called puja, which is a way of ceremony from Hindu tradition of honoring one another. A way to do this is simply by eye gazing with a loved one. for 10, 15, 20 minutes, just eye gazing. We can hold each other for longer periods of time, melt into each other's arms. It's a practice that we have now that we must develop because we are such a touch-deprived society and a repressed society, both in emotions and sexuality. 
there are new tools and new groups. Tantra practices and Tantra being a complex word, but in terms of what I mean right now, Tantra meaning communion with the beloved or communion with the divine, weaving of two, weaving of duality into non-duality presence. When we get into non-duality, we have a sort of transcendent experience often. And usually that transcendent experience can be interchangeable with eroticism. These divine states of bliss, divine states of ecstasy that many saints and mystics would experience were actually experiences of eroticism, of their sexual energy, their kundalini feeling their entire body and bursting out through the ethers. That was normal. That is a part of mastery. Mastery of our sexual energy begins with the mastery of the self. So it's all this sort of gentle experimentation without attachment because a huge key here is that humans are attached to orgasm. Humans are attached to orgasmic relief. When the erotic is everything. Some may even say the erotic is everything but orgasm. It's the divine play. It's the relational ecstasy. It's presence without ego having some sort of ulterior motive or attachment or expectation. When we can dissolve the ego of expectation of sex or our sexual energy, then we can dissolve that ego into our body and transform that into love. But yes, to get back to your question, Max, touch is very necessary. And for some, celibacy may not be possible because of this. But there is some understanding of what are the checks and balances. And what are some potential opportunities of having platonic relationships that are engaged with touch and sensitivity and physical nourishment that does not lead to sex or has any intention about sex. These are new paradigm relationships and people are waking up to this necessary element of life. One of the main questions which bothers me now, I'm writing the book and um, that question kind of, the as, as idea of ascension is central to all spiritual teachings at the moment and the communications from the aliens. And um, when we try to pinpoint the time when it's going to happen, the predictions are so drastically different. Like some expected next year, some expected in our lifetime, and some expected like few generations from now, about 180 years from now. The definition of ascension, as I understand, is when the humanity connects telepathically and makes a quantum leap into the new... Uh, 
new way of things, new reality of things, new uh, world. And um, so two questions. First is your idea of the timing. And second is the role of uh, emotions. I guess emotions, empathy is, is key for telepathy, right? So the role of emotions in, uh, in ascension. Timing. I'm receiving is not relevant right now. I'm receiving that. It's something for each one of us to see and to visualize what that timeline may be right now. That may change in the future when I'm asked this question, but my guides are wanting me to encourage others to take this into their own intuition and truth, to explore this, because otherwise it'll just be gossip and gossip is another waste of energy is what I'm receiving for today. It looks like we are, you know, Mandela effect when different timelines come together. It looks like we co coexist now. Some people will ascend, will jump in a timeline which is ascending now soon. Others will, <laughs> will wait for it for next generations to come. So we are just kind of will diverge at some point. So it's hard to predict for everybody. It uh, is. I heard uh, that we have we are the manifestors, and the way uh, in which we uh, look will manifest, and uh, we need to each and every one uh, take action because it's uh, the only way to manifest it. It is not. Yes, this is true. Thank you for that comment. It is absolutely true that we are manifesting the timeline as we speak. And it will won't happen if we, we wait for it. Correct. It is purposefully intentional right action. It is not just waiting and daydreaming about it. It is actually transforming our lives in every single element. Now about the role of uh, erotics in, uh, and emotions in ascension. What, what is it and how is it related? I feel as if I answered that question. And ah. the only, I mean, I suppose the last part about the ascension is that if we, don't master our sovereign sexual energy. There will not be an ascension. Does uh, becoming how I self uh, meaning to be to become bold and uh, and full and uh, feelful uh, in our emotions? Uh, it is uh, the right path. Becoming our higher self means to release fear, and it means to be fearless and with love and to dissolve into unconditional love as a means of the light and spirit. Thank you. I guess what I was asking for was the physical, more like physical question is, you know, when we ascend, what is going to be with our sexual nature? You know, what is that beyond the veil? It's still and in the soul. The soul is this star. Imagine the soul as a star. Mm -hmm. And imagine the star has all the imprints of time, 
somehow configurated, almost as if the stars have telomeres inside of them. And the telomeres have a story about the transformation of the human, mm -hmm. transformation of the human in its ability to reach a place without desire in a place that is love, because this is what we're talking about, unity consciousness. And part of unity consciousness is connecting holy, innocent energies with our sexual erotic natures with each other and honoring that in each one another and not shaming it or not disvaluing it it is honoring the whole entire body as a canvas, as a sacred canvas of story and beauty. And that has a lot to do with the ascension. It's just simply the honoring of the body as sacred vessel and the emotions as sacred and holy. Thank you. Um, I invite the uh, next blessing in any language you like, maybe galactic language if you like. Ingo doiko, egaikuya moi, elokuya boya, aikuyala, eyakoyala. Maiki e ai do e quela ma e no quilu e o e no yala. I shall ma e inga hoya e a mo e guya. I guiki kai kiki ai kiki ai kia lo me ai. I go yala ma. Ho me e a hummi ai go. Inka hutnye kai chigi uka la poyanti. E ayi lama uki kai. E ayi koi lama uki. E nyo chupu ki ka. E no kai alapa. E kai yai ki alai koi. E yo koi. E du koi ya kai la. A muka yi la i ki ya. E mo ki ya ki alai ko. Ai ku kui en poi yi ta. E a mi e. Pulsa, e pulsa e se kwe, inga kwe, laiko, ma. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Many blessings, everyone. Many blessings. All right, we ran out of time. I wish we could continue. We should continue some other time. So I went to Brooks, Brooks' uh, website, and it's beautiful, simple, and you can reserve a session now. There is a sale for $66. You can uh, go pay with PayPal or credit card. And I, I'm having sessions with Brook for years now, and some of them, like manifest, help me manifest miracles. And it was, she was instrumental. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it just, you know, practical manifestation through emotional work. And, um, you know, simple things, simple advices come from the other side. And she is uh, basically trans, transmitting, transmitting them here, kind of. Uh, you ask a question and you get the answer from from the other side and Brooke is a good channel so it happens and um, I asked the right questions I got the right answers and got the right help from the other side and it, it, it's easy and um, yeah it's true <laughs> so so um, Brooke is more available than before and more grounded as before in certain you know, geographically grounded in a specific place, specific timing. So, so she's more available in this reality than before because previously she was more in other realms where she, she was not that reachable. So, so you can use that opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Max. 
All right. I think we are done. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody, and thank you, the future viewers. Um, and the way to contact Brooke is through her website, brookealison.com. Many blessings and great gratitude for this transmission. And I'm closing the portal now. Yes. An etheric golden bubble light. Satnam. Satnam. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.